Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about recovery community partnerships and how they make recovery work. Joining us in our panel today are Carol Conquest, Recovery Corps Coordinator, Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems Incorporated, Baltimore, Maryland. Cynthia moreno Tui, Executive Director, NADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals, Alexandria, Virginia. James Gillen, Director, Anchor Recovery Community Center, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Jeremiah Hawkins, Family Services Director, the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, Washington, D.C. Cynthia, let's talk a little bit about the definitions of recovery for both the addiction treatment community as well as the mental health community. Thank you, Yvette. Recovery from alcohol, drugs, and mental health means having a chance to change your life, to be positive, happy, and healthy. That includes your home, your sense of well-being, your place in community, as well as your purpose in life. The difference in alcohol and drugs is that you're also working with a chemical and balance around that alcohol or drug use to your brain. And so there's other pieces that you take into play as part of your recovery as a result of that. And Jim, in terms of how recovery is interpreted, where does it begin in the continuum of, of the improvement of the life of that person that is seeking recovery? Well, we look at the whole person and you know what do they need for wellness? What do they need to lead a healthy lifestyle? Is it treatment for their alcohol and drugs? Is it treatment for their mental health? Housing, of course, and, and social support. So we look at everything and, and what we, do, we try to assess the situation. And then just recovery is, everything is part of the recovery process is how we look at it. Okay. And it really begins at the place that the person identifies it. Right. You know, people identify recovery at different places. Absolutely. And so it is what comes within. So uh, the role of community, Carol, how are the components of recovery support within the community um, are there some guiding principles that need to be looked at and adopted? Well, one of the main things with um, the inclusion of community in the recovery process is that it takes a holistic approach to supporting that person. Um, individuals in recovery, they have the tendency of needing not just the treatment element, but what happens after they leave treatment. You know, is that community um, recovery friendly? And we have to, you know, create that atmosphere of mutual goal seeking. And we do that by respecting one another. And we also support each other by providing those necessary support like housing, like educational opportunities. And we need to tear down what most in recovery experience, which is stigmas. So they're not really looked upon as a community member. And I think that's where the language needs to change. We need to start um, including people. And when we can get community organizations involved in the recovery process, we create that, that community of wellness, I would say. When people are using to, they're in a little box, you know, and it's, and what happens often is when people come into recovery, they're still in a box, it's a little bit bigger, and then they're, they're, they're somewhat trapped there. And we found that it makes it a lot more difficult to sustain, sustain long-term recovery you know, unless you get out there. And a big part so Jim, of it. Explain to me what that box would contain. Well, it's got walls. And, uh, and the thing is, and they may just go, and we'll send them, and they may just go to a support group and, you know, be, live in fear. Oh, I, I'm going to pass a liquor store. I'm going to see somebody that I used to use with. Rhode Island is like one big small town. So people, everybody knows each other. You're going to run into people that you used to use with. So what happens is, we want them to branch out and really have these tools um, to be able to live life and to bust out of that box. And being part of your community is something that we stress. So to lose the fear of really uh, being able to operate mm -hmm. and to exist yes. within and have the freedom yeah. of not, not fearing going into relapse if they run into exactly. some of the circumstances and exactly. individuals that they yeah. used mm -hmm. to. And and part of that too is that whole thing about getting back to employment 
or school so mm -hmm. that you begin to feel like you're you're moving your life in a positive manner. So in addiction or in mental health issues, sometimes you are in that box because of that disease. And when you begin to recognize the tools to move out of that box, then you expand your whole lifestyle in terms of, I could go back to school or mm -hmm. I could get employed. I can wake up at a certain hour now mm -hmm. and actually follow through with the things that I was not able to follow through yeah. with before. And I, yeah, I mean, and about the community, I think the individual in recovery, either from mental health or from substance use, wants to be a part of a community. And so it's enabling them to, to be a part of that community. And uh, Carol was speaking about earlier, it's about helping them with employment and housing and all those stressors that can lead to a relapse, you know, can lead to those yeah. things. Eliminating those barriers is one of the keys to recovery because stress or unemployment or those things that sort of come along with that are those precursors to a relapse or to, you know, stop taking your medication yeah. or those kind of things. I think there's a sincere desire to be a part of yeah. your community, yeah. uh, especially in Ward 8 where I work. I mean, substance use and abuse is prevalent and that's going to be everywhere. Right. So how do you function within that community and still be successful? That's the key. Mm -hmm. And it's building those tools. I can. I can be a productive member of society. You know, you can believe in yourself and that's the goal as we preach it for recovery. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about in terms of the number of people that are actually in need of recovery services, Cynthia? Well, currently we're only treating about 10% of those mm -hmm. uh, with substance use disorder. So that's about 1.1 uh, million, and we need treatment for about 23 million. So there's, there's a big gap between who's receiving actual treatment and who isn't receiving treatment. And within that, we're really not, in, are we including the people that are already in recovery that should be Right, that's connecting with some sort of uh, recovery support, support network. You're absolutely right, Yvette. That's the other issue is we have millions that are in recovery that need some level of support, whether it's peer mentoring or it's navigation through the healthcare system mm -hmm. or it's community support in terms of building that life in the community and getting um, other supports for their family because the family's also involved in mm -hmm. recovery. Mm -hmm. So we need to remember that the family is a piece of that. So now we're talking about probably one out of four Americans need some type of service around addiction and mental health. You are all my heroes in recovery. You have all gone through this. I'm gonna start with Carol and, and give us your impression of what uh, your your passage was and whether you took advantage of recovery support services. Well, one of the unique things about my process was when I went into treatment after trying so many times, um, I found the treatment setting that was real supportive of those continuing support services. And um, this treatment facility director, she allowed me and two other gentlemen to start a peer support group. With starting that peer support group, it started out with just us three, but then we grew to well over 150 members. And what year was that? Morning? That was in 2006. Wow. Yeah. So we've been doing what we've been doing for a while, and one of the things that we saw as a very valuable tool was the inclusion of family. We hold an annual Family and Friends Day where we invite the family members so they can see that people do get better because a lot of times, like, um, Jim was saying that we get put in this box. We're not part of the community. We're over here, they're over there. And when you include the family, they get to see that, okay, there is hope for my family member. Now they become advocates for you. They support what you do, and now they're preaching the language that, hey, people do get better. So that's been my journey. I've been just a grassroots individual who just want to keep sharing that, hey, you can do this. And you sort of moved into, as part of your... Uh, employment opportunity to work in the field and when we come back I want to touch on the lives of other members of the panel and they will share their stories with you we'll be right back Recovery support services are really critical. First and foremost, it's critical that our service delivery systems be recovery oriented. So we're not there just to deliver a treatment service. We're actually there to help people regain their lives. 
So that's why the, the services that are specifically directed toward, toward recovery support are so critical. These are services that may not necessarily be covered by an insurance policy. They may be things like transportation or things like childcare or support in getting an, a job or e just even social support, supports to learn how to um, or have new ways of socializing in uh, effective and positive ways. So those recovery support services are critical to the underpinning of success and they're uh, critical to the underpinning of uh, changing our service delivery systems to be more recovery oriented and more uh, positive outcomes for people. One of the first things to keep in mind when we talk about recovery support services or recovery support programs is having a good sense of uh, the spectrum of needs that an individual might have. First of all, every individual is unique. So we have to keep that in mind. But there are a range of services that we can expect uh, might be called to into play in order to help that individual. We're generally talking about non-clinical services, social services, housing issues. We're also talking about uh, uh, some um, emotional support. We're talking about relapse prevention and case management. Uh, we're talking about that spectrum of services that allows that individual to maintain uh, their recovery from alcohol and or substance use or from mental uh, illness. Willowick House is a place um, for people to get their lives together and come uh, and live just normal lives. You know, once you get out of treatment, it's kind of a culture shock. You're like, holy cow, I'm sober now. You know, I'm used to operating drunk or whatever your drug of choice is. You know, and you obviously don't have, usually you don't have a bunch of funds to just draw off of. So you need a cheap living environment. So it's just good to have, a, like I said, that support group around you to help you reintegrate you with less shock to your system so that you desire less to go use to go back and fall into those patterns. The main thing about it is the support they get in this house. The other members of Oxford uh, that they can go to when they need stuff, you know, where you can't, you, can, you don't have that anywhere else. You know, here people know uh, what you've been through, what you're going through, and um, they're always here for you to talk to them. You know, and it's, you got shoulders to lean. But I love to cook and entertain. So, you know, with a bunch of guys living together, they, they probably don't always get the best meals. And so it's fun for me to come and just hang out with them. This is like a meeting for me when I can come and, you know, and, and we can talk and share. Just go to the doctor, but they're closed. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just going to go home now. The most unique thing about Oxford is that it's a democratic house. It's run by the people who live here. You don't have one person in charge telling you where you need to go or what you need to do. It's run by the entire house. So everybody's got to say it's a little bit more responsibility. And for me, it's, uh, it's basically it's the accountability and at the same time, the socialization, you know, that, uh, that you get when you're living in and amongst peers. And, um, you know, everybody has your back and you have everybody's back. So this is this house is 20 years old and to celebrate that we had a barbecue folks from all over the state and from other states as well come in and uh, met uh, some old timers that had like 30 years being clean and sober and uh, we had a good time Well, I believe the way that Oxford does things, you know, kind of letting you live your life the way you want to do it and not having such a strict, you know, guidelines of how you, you do this or you're out, you know. I mean, there is, there are those rules, there's things to that nature, but it's not so tight where you can find what works for you. The structure of Oxford, what it brings for me is like, you know, delegating activities like chores actually doing your chores by a specific time, so you, you know, time management and uh, money management as well, like paying rent. Because I didn't know how to do any of that. Like, I didn't know how to balance a checkbook or, I mean, I knew how to do certain household chores, but I hadn't done them in a while, you know? 
and it gives you, it eases you into it without having like all on, as if I were to just live on my own and have to do it all at once. There's people in recovery, there's people at meetings that you meet that you can bring with you, but here, you know, they see you every day and they know more of your struggles than other people in recovery. And that it's just like a family member, you know, I can take any problem too, or if I need help with anything, they'll always be there and vice versa, you know, they know they can call me if they need anything. And that's a really amazing thing to have for the rest of your life. With me personally, I, I needed help. I couldn't do this on my own. And as far as most of the people I've seen, they can't do it on their, their, their own. You know, they've tried for years and years and years. And, and with this, this structure and with Oxford and with this help there, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable how much they've actually helped me over the last year. I mean, without them, I was so lost, I had no idea where I was going when I got out of treatment. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea where to start. I had nobody, because I had ran everybody off that ever cared about me or I cared about. Without Oxford, Oxford saved my life. End of story, you know? And with that help, I was able to talk to somebody and get this stuff out and be able to continue on my path of doing the right thing. So Jeremiah, were you also engaged in recovery support services or did you become uh, engaged as you went along in, in, in your path to recovery? Uh, no, I was uh, initially engaged in uh, recovery services. I went through uh, treatment as a much younger person uh, and uh, went through treatment and, and found support groups in the community that sort of uh, helped me uh, along my path. And certainly uh, the good thing about uh, community supports like that is there were certainly, my path in recovery hasn't been straight. And I, I think that's pretty typical of people in recovery. And I think that's what how, I learned. How so? You want to explain a little bit for well, our I, audience? I originally... Um, went to treatment when I was 19 uh, and uh, that was really really young and uh, after a few years I uh, made a really conscious conscious decision to uh, what do they say test the waters again uh, and really to uh, head back out and see uh, if I really was uh, an alcoholic a, an, an addict turns out I am uh, and I was fortunate enough to still have so a in other words you present. relapse a little bit a, a little bit for two years, yeah. So it's a, it'd be a little bit more than a little bit. I gave it a good effort, you know. Yes. Um, but I think the key point is that uh, I was able to turn around and go to that same meeting that I went to two years before. And the same guys were in that same room and uh, welcomed me with open arms. And I think that that's the key to a recovery community is that it's there, you know. It's not dependent on funding. It's not dependent on anything else but the people that show up every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. or whatever it might be. Um, and that really, that meeting, those men were the key to my recovery, so. And you know, it's funny because we're, we're beginning to, to work very much with young people in recovery. And, and mm -hmm. I'm glad that you shared your story because I think it's particularly difficult for young people in recovery mm -hmm. to sustain their recovery. Correct, yeah. Cynthia? That's really true. Yes, I, I began recovery at 15 and a half mm -hmm. after being um, put into many different homes as a result of my mother's addiction. So I began amphetamine addiction uh, at the age of 10. And then by the time I was 15 and a half, I was pretty well cooked from my addiction and um, was in a last chance foster home. So my community became the, uh, the church that my foster care family was involved in. And that was a, a whole new community for me with a lot of other supports that I had not realized, including medical support and dental support, and, um, and then just socialization and how do you you know, living on the street and being in all these different homes, how do you then become more normal and social, uh, which was really good for me. And then in college is where I recognized I really am addicted because I relapsed, had a long-term relapse, thinking that I was okay and then almost dying. So sometimes in addiction, uh, we have to realize that we really are addicted. And, and also, I think family members have to understand that there's light. There's a light at the end of the t tunnel, mm -hmm. you know, and that they have to stick with with the process. Jim, I want to ask you. You you've been very engaged in in Rhode Island uh, recovery community efforts. Uh, talk to me about what led you to become a peer to peer okay. uh, support uh, uh, well, person. I woke up in Rhode Island and I didn't know where I was. I was in Brooklyn the night before, so it was a very inauspicious start. Uh, I had been 
in and out of recovery for many years. I did a lot of tests in the waters. And, um, you know, I was frightened. I was a stranger in a strange land. And I reached out like I always did. I tried to find um, a bed in a treatment center for somebody that was uninsured. And funny, in my case, it was the Providence Center, which I now work for. And I was able to get a bed. And one thing that I did, and I think being in a strange land was helpful because it forced me to really reach out and get involved. We started with a... um, uh, it was like an alumni group of the treatment center. We created it and we started it and, and I found that that was really my niche. So I'd reach out and I started to get involved more than just my recovery support groups. I started to get involved in the community early and for me it was very good and it just kept growing. Then I got involved with our recovery community organization which is Right Cares in, uh, in Rhode Island and that opened a whole bunch of new horizons. And then it just kept, and then I got involved with Recovery Month. Oh, forget about it now. So it's... Uh, but how, how is it? What, what, where is the transition from I am in recovery? You know, Carol talked a little bit about that. And then you all of a sudden say, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to give back. I really want to get engaged. Mm-hmm. Is that what happens? There's, all of a sudden we, you recognize that by helping others that you that that's going to help your own recovery path yes, absolutely and let me just add i think that's the importance of um peer to peer support because what we do is we show each other how to navigate how to reach out to the resources because as jim said you know okay i was forced to you know and a lot of us do feel that way that okay nobody's going to help me but when you come across a peer who says look i will help you that begins that process of, okay, I'm gonna trust you. And now I found the comrade that walks that journey with me. And, and that's what we call the therapeutic value. You know, I'm helping you to do the things that I know you need help with, but I'm not doing it for you. Mm-hmm. But I'll be there to support you. And, and, and that creates that system. And then some of us go in to become a professional in the addiction workforce because uh, not only do we enjoy the peer to peer, we want to dig a little bit deeper Mm -hmm. into helping to move through the traumas Mm -hmm. that happen because everyone that has an addictive disorder or mental health disorder has trauma. We have different levels of trauma Mm -hmm. we experience from our mental health issues or our addiction issues. And sometimes we need support to move through that, Mm -hmm. to recognize it, to treat it, and to let it go so that we can be this happy, healthy person in community. And, and so there's a role for all of us, depending on, on where you want to um, be. We all have a place. Yeah. Jeremiah. And I think my road to recovery led me to, to social work because I felt like uh, social work sort of encompassed for me the world that recovery sort of lives within. And you were talking about the trauma and, and the difficulties with employment and education and all those things that are all those bits and pieces that I think a lot of people in recovery sort of deal with. And so, you know, my my professional career has led me down a path to sort of try to address all the ills that a community might face, uh, you know, looking at Ward 8 and, and within that are mental illness, are, you know, substance use and abuse and all those things sort of folded on top of all the other traumas that occur every day. I mean, yesterday at noon we had uh, a section, you know, a few blocks from us, we had a shooting. I mean, took place mm-hmm. right there, 30 kids, you know, are present uh, at a daycare sort of facility and, and luckily nobody died. But that's trauma. That's why people can relapse and use. So we're trying to address the community ills uh, to make sure that we're addressing all those things that lead to substance use that do all those kind of things. So for me, that's where my path has sort of led me and I've just sort of followed that. Mm-hmm. So. Very well. Let's talk a little bit about how is it that where does the recovery support services fit in to the whole notion of a recovery-oriented system of care, Jim? Well, it's key. The non-clinical aspect of it is very important where we have, um, you know, peers, because a peer, a person in recovery is also a role model to those seeking recovery, and that is so key. So they're helping them access in a in that non, and I, I say non-clinical because it's important because they, they're unequal. Sometimes they feel very intimidated with the person on the other side of the desk. And so now this is somebody that's been where they've been and they help them, you know, accessing housing, not doing the work for them, but helping them, helping them with recovery coaching, helping them with employment and other community supports. It's huge. Very good. Um, recovery support services, um, 
within that strategy, uh, does it come earlier? Can someone be in a, in a recovery support group if they haven't finished their, their uh, treatment units? Well, if I may answer that, um, I think it begins wherever that person is. And the reason I say that is because one of the things that we found key with the um, peer support group that I started was that we were calling ourselves an alumni group. And we had so many people sitting on the sidelines because they felt like, oh, I need to complete this first before I can mm -hmm. be a part of. Mm -hmm. So that's when we changed the name to Recovery Empowerment Group. So that way we can be more inclusive. And okay. that, that follows that Ross model that, you know, we need not to, as Jim stated earlier, about that box. We can put people in a box by saying that you don't meet this criteria. Right. That person needs help where they are. Yeah. When we come back, I want to come back to this theme of how the system really opens up in a way to be inclusive. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression, and help was there. I found support as I rebuilt my life, piece by piece. With the help of my family and recovery support community, I'm rebuilding my life. And through recovery, I am whole again. Join, Join the Voices for recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. recovery we offer a kind of a holistic opportunity for people and what that means for us is for people to come in and to, and to see that recovery is just not about quitting uh, it's not even just about a recovery program it's about getting our life back communities for recovery has quite a few resources that we offer to people who are I I seeking recovery in the community we have a community room with the ping pong table and uh, we also have a, a an area where people can watch recovery videos and other types of educational programming uh, we've uh, just recently expanded and, and added a recovery cafe and it provides a, a tremendous amount of support for people that just want to have a place to to work on their recovery program once they come and connect with people who have had long-term sobriety, they join that community of sober people and they make friends. They learn about the resources available through Communities for Recovery. One of the other programs we have is the, the Career Closet and for people to intend to come and find clothes that they need to go on a job interview. It aligns great with the computer room. What we're doing is we're helping people to learn how to write cover letters, uh, update their resume and at the same time uh, with our coaching process some coaches help people find jobs and so in that then they can go use the the career closet it's not just a place where people can come get jeans and shirts it's really intentional for people to dress to go to, to go to work my role here at communities for recovery is um, I'm a volunteer I'm pretty sure that um, that when I sit down with a, with another alcoholic or addict that I can talk to him about some things that, um, that no other professional could. Um, I can reach him on levels because I've lived it. I've walked in his shoes. The volunteers we have today that are giving back in community were initially people we were serving. A newcomer will go through and, and uh, get the program and he will come back to do it again with another person as a temporary sponsor. It's, it's a wonderful volunteer building program. Recovery support is so important to somebody's recovery journey because when you first come out of treatment you need a relationship with somebody who's been in recovery and that's one of our goals is to develop those relationships while we're helping people in the treatment centers so that when they come out they have somebody to be in contact with who's been in recovery. What I do um, as a recovery coach is we offer a specialized one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, with somebody that is in recovery that's looking for the basic needs basically of life. You give to keep. I've been seeing it through 
community for recovery. Because the more I give back, the more I give, the more I give, the more I want to give. And the most sober, I stay so sober. And the joy and the merriment you get from it. Believe it or not, community for recovery has become me. I'm just, I just feel it. The reason that, that it's important for communities for recovery to address so many different facets of a person's life is because recovery is about our whole life. It's not just about stopping using or stopping drinking. It's about um, how we interact with people on the street, how we, how we uh, manage stress from being able to have a job or not have a job, help people to identify, help people to get connected with how to be able to manage all of those things in their lives. Uh, that's what helps keep people from relapsing. We've worked very, very hard to build relationships in the community because we realize that it is a we disease, it is a community issue, and that the more people know that we are all here to help that person, the better off we are. And how that's happened is, is the more agencies we're involved with, the more people have access to share the programs that we offer. Communities for Recovery, for me very early on, provided a way for me to um, do something for other people. It feels so different inside now uh, that I want to do everything that I can possibly do to help somebody else feel that. Giving back is, is probably the most important part of recovery uh, and, and being able to do it from the heart. There's so many people out there with a need for recovery from not only alcoholism or drug abuse, but also co-occurring mental illness. And there's so many of us out there, and that's why there's a need for a place like uh, Communities for Recovery. So we were talking about how recovery support services can actually be the initiator of someone in their recovery, correct, Jeremiah? A absolutely. I mean, I think it's an introduction to uh, a way into recovery, uh, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it's always the same path for everybody. And that's why I think, uh, you know, peer recovery services and treatment and all the different options, you know, are there for somebody to sort of fit in wherever they feel most comfortable. Because if you don't feel comfortable in the process, it's less than likely that you're really going to be authentic sure. in that. And I yeah. think authenticity in recovery is one of the key things. So really, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, getting into treatment and those kind of things. Treatment might not be in somebody's game plan. I know plenty of people that are in recovery and quite successful that have just used 12-step programs or you know, use their own method, yeah. actually. Uh, and so we talk about that continuum. Everybody should be welcomed at the beginning all the way through the end because you can learn something when we talk about those peer to peer relationships from anybody along their continuum and in their own process. So I feel like to uh, put that box again around somebody really uh, is doing a disservice to those other people in recovery that may learn from that individual. We all have something to share in that case. And Jim, looking at some of the people in the audience who may have an addiction problem and may be listening, Tell me, what would you tell them um, in terms of where they need to fit in, you know, and, and if they think that treatment is not for them, as Jeremiah mm -hmm. has noted, tell me what would you say to them to, to bring them in? I would say that you need to be the author of your own recovery. You're the driver. Our job, what role can we do to complement what your needs are? How can we engage you in a way that, a realistic way that you think will work for you? Not that this is my plan, mm -hmm. and if you don't follow it, it's not going to work. That's not going to work. They're the driver. They're the author. Yeah. And to encourage them to really uh, uh, talk to someone, yeah. correct, mm -hmm. uh, Carol? Correct. Yes, correct. That's huge. Very good. Um, community coalitions. Let's talk a little bit about how the recovery support services not only provides peer-to-peer, -peer, but it also tries to change the minds of the community, correct, Carol? That's correct. Yeah, one of the things that this whole um, recovery-oriented system of care is about, that inclusiveness, is to hear how um, the communities feel about the recovering person and then see where we can find that medium. You're still doing um, the peer-to-peer, but we're doing it from a different place. Let's say, for example, I'm no longer that individual in recovery. I'm a community member who cares about my community, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna use my tools to bring the community into this process of wellness. I like to tell people that um, 
if we start changing some of our language, we may get more buy-in from people. Because remember, certain words have a certain stigma attached to them, and it runs people away. And I think we have to make those um, flexible adjustments to allow people to see it from a different point of view. And I think the community collaborations begin by the language we use. Mm -hmm. and that's really what you know. my organization, uh, what its purpose really is, is to uh, bring together all the resources that are within the community so that they're communicating well with one another, so that the services really get out to the people that need that's them, right. and not trying to be everything to everyone. We have a coalition of over 300 members, and those are individuals who've come through our program and are now mm -hmm. trying to help one another, and those are also organizations who do different things to different specific populations, and making sure that those all line up. Such as, uh, be more explicit. Absolutely, so uh, making sure that we have services for specifically people with substance use and abuse, uh, services for mental health uh, issues, uh, people that might have HIV and AIDS, and making right. sure that all of those are lined up so that when somebody walks through our door, and we, we serve the individual who walks through their door and their family to make sure that everybody within that family can help support that That's person. Right. Because if you don't have that, you know, the, that one person is sort of alone. So we have a, a myriad of services for anybody. We don't do it all. We make sure that the community at large is sort of wrapping its arms mm -hmm. around right. that individual and that family. And I think that's really key. The other key point is, as we were talking about, sort of the stigma. I know, uh, at least in the community that I work in, it's, it's more accepted to have a substance use problem than a mental health issue, right. right? So a lot of the people that I work with don't want to be crazy, mm -hmm. but they don't have a problem saying, I, I use PCP. <laughs> All right, and so we'll let, let's address the PCP use because that's where you're at right now, and then let's work at, at large as a community to address the stigma of having a mental health issue, which may very well lead to your substance abuse issue. So it's tackling a lot of different issues mm -hmm. at once. Very good. I think one way that we tackle it um, in the addiction community and the mental health community is to really do things that help to support awareness publicly. Mm -hmm. So things like Recovery Month really helps to get the message out in community, helps to reduce the stigma, helps people to feel more connected. So if I feel more connected with you, I'm less likely to blame you for your mental health disease or your mm -hmm. addiction disease. I'm more likely to, to become engaged with you. And if I see that you're more like me than different like me, then I'm going to be more connected. I'm going to support programs in community. Right. There's going to be less, oh no, we can't have that here right. because these are people who are mentally ill or these are people who are addicts. And that's part of the language that language. we need to change too. Mm -hmm. That we are people in recovery from something that many, many people are in recovery from. And most of us are in recovery from something. Mm -hmm. And, and that, I think that's an important message. Very right. good. I want to talk a little bit. You mentioned Recovery Month, of course, uh, and thank you for doing so. <laughs> um, Recovery Month indeed uh, has a platform that is an online platform. Uh, there now uh, the 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 field is moving into health information technologies mm -hmm. that are going to facilitate it. In which way does health information technology? facilitate the work of recovery support? Well, it helps to exchange health information so, so that there is a continuum of information that goes, that follows the client instead of going from place to place, retelling your story 20 different mm -hmm. times. So it also helps promote your own wellness because you're not re-traumatizing yourself each time telling your story. It captures the information that needs to be captured and shared and it also gives you a place to have a plan so that you can carry that plan from one place to another. And you feel that, that um, just that support in knowing that I don't have to retell this story, I don't have to bring new paperwork each place I go, and, and it's confidential. And are any of you engaged in health information technology? Uh, you know, the Far Southeast Collaborative, we certainly uh, make sure that we utilize health information technology in a way to make information more accessible to right. the community. And we do that in a variety of ways, but uh, predominantly by making sure uh, technology is available, having computer labs, keeping them open, mm -hmm. helping people use them. Uh, we work with a lot of people who might not have a high school education, like mm -hmm. how do I use a computer, how do I read, you know, doing all those things. Those barriers to the basic services that many of us take for granted, we make sure that we sort of break those down so everybody has the same sort of opportunity. So providing them access 
simply to a computer, to the internet, which in a lot of communities I think we take for granted again because, you know, at least in Ward 8 in Washington, D.C., not a lot of people are going to have access to all those kinds of things. They don't have access in the schools in Ward 8. And so making sure that we have the availability to that kind of technology so they can access that kind of information that's out there for them to seek, I think is a really key point. And well, I think, and go ahead. The technology that they do have is on their phones. Right. And yeah. so really giving good support through phone technology Absolutely. is really important. Absolutely. Because you may not have the money for a computer, how many people don't have a phone? Right, right. Everybody has a phone. This There's is what so I wanted people. to get at. It's not just the health records, which people need to be mm -hmm. very uh, aware of and right. monitor the safety of where those records are. And I think that, that can certainly help and will help to reduce our health care costs, short term right. and long term. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but also using that technology with the mobile uh, uh, messaging and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, correct? Right. Correct, especially with young people. And we have a lot of young people that are coming to us and what better way to reach them? I mean, anyone that has kids, if I call my kids, it's days before they call me back, but if I text them, hey dad, what's up? You know, within seconds. And so we know that that's a, a very effective way to reach out to people and everybody has a phone. They have the pay as you go, but they have text, they have uh, internet access, they have email. So that's, it's, a, it's a key um, recovery tool that is so valuable. And it's immediate. That's the oh, other thing. Oh, yeah. Instant it's gratification. Immediate. Right, which is what the limbic system wants. That's why right. we get addicted. So you have that instant support yes. instead of instant yes. gratification to mm -hmm. use or to, to get yeah. depressed or to have other difficulty. Yeah. You have instant gratification for support. And we haven't even touched the online uh, counseling services that right. are available so right. that people need to know yeah. about as well. When we come back, I want to talk about the whole discriminatory language that we tapped on a little bit, uh, but I think we need to uh, expand on that. We'll be right back. Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others, I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join, Join the Voices, Voices for recovery. recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Pathways to Housing DC was started to end homelessness for people living on the street, jails and psychiatric hospitals of DC with um, serious mental illness, psychiatric disabilities. And Pathways came into my life, kind of held my hand, took me to my appointments, got things done, set doctor's appointments, filled out paperwork for me until I can able to do it by myself. They showed me the things to do. We have treatment teams working with people in their apartments um, that consist of psychiatrist, nurse, peer specialist, employment, housing specialist, social workers, all wrapping services around each person. And AC delivery and AC. Electronic health records in today's healthcare delivery is critical. When we decided to implement the electronic health record, we knew we wanted to be able to give the best patient care possible. We wanted to have the best tools uh, for our staff so that they could give the best care. We now equip our staff with um, varying pieces of technology to help their jobs. Some use tablets, some use smartphones, some are using laptops with wireless, and so they can, with the person in their home, sit down and pull up their treatment plan, for example, or pull up their medication and review with them, um, you know, how is it working for you, what's, you know, what's, uh, what can be helpful and they can pull up the records from the other providers and our teams who are seeing the person, one of which is Unity Healthcare. 
the electronic medical record has really helped us move forward because everyone has access at any time to the treatment information. Um, yeah, we schedule your appointment. That pathways and we can see the case managers as well as we see the doctors and we don't have to waste our time going over, you know, the other side of town. Yeah, yeah. The doctors is familiar with the case managers. The case managers are fit, familiar with the doctors and everything, and they have access to our records, and it's very good here. With you know the click of a button and online, the provider here, our nurse practitioner, when they see someone can pull up the records from all of those other sites, so the person doesn't have to repeat their history, repeat you know what uh, treatment they had, and they can really have access firsthand to all the treatments. Unity, um, they know me. They know what's wrong with me, my health issues, and I feel more comfortable with somebody knowing that's wrong with my health issues than to go to somebody that doesn't. Within the, um, the electronic medical records, there are data elements in place that um, allow us to assess for um, different behavioral issues such as like risky alcohol intake and substance abuse use, uh, tobacco use, and those types of things. And, and we can take that information and uh, kind of get an idea of where the patient is and how we can uh, meet the patient needs and um, communicating with uh, the appropriate uh, mental health provider um, within the organization. So the electronic medical records pulls it together and it allows for the medical team to be more integrated in the delivery of care. If, if I'm a doctor, I might be seeing a patient, but the most important person in that patient might be the outreach worker who's going out to the a patient's house and actually visiting with her and then reporting back. So it's a more comprehensive kind of approach to, um, to the treatment. And it really um, has saved lives here, actually. We've seen that firsthand. If it wasn't for pathways coming in my life, I, I, I probably wouldn't be living unity. And it saves me a lot of time and I know they know what's going on, so I mean, I thank God for unity and everything. I want to talk a little bit about one of my biggest concerns, and that is um, the use of the language. Primarily, number one is how people in recovery refer to themselves mm -hmm. and what that language does to underscore the discriminatory practices within the broader society. Cynthia, I see you shaking your head. Well, early on in my recovery, because I was so young, I just talked about myself as being a kid that wanted to do things differently than what I was doing. And later there became some terminology to support that, and that term recovery became more recognized in the language. And so I think it is important to say, I'm a person in recovery from whatever you're in recovery from. I never accepted the term addict because when I use that word, and particularly as a foster kid, I already had that label. I was a foster kid, a ward of the court, a juvenile delinquent, and incorrigible. I had enough labels. I didn't want any more labels. I wanted people to see me first as a human being Secondly, as a person trying to do something different. And lastly, as someone who was the scuds of the earth. And how do we get the mutual support community, Jim, to understand that by using the, uh, a certain uh, type of language mm -hmm. that they are perpetuating, I mean, certainly in a room with themselves, that is one issue. But when you walk outside and you're looking at the broader community and you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, mm -hmm. I'm the other, and not using the, the more um, supportive yeah. language mm -hmm. towards yourself, mm -hmm. I am in recovery. I mean, to me, being in recovery is one of the hardest things that an individual could ever do in their whole entire life. Okay. And so I would, were I in that position, I would want to celebrate that. I would yes. want to say, you know what? I'm in recovery and I fought the biggest fight that I've ever fought in my life and as a consequence of that and, or as a result of that mm -hmm. wonderful um, you know, journey, I am now going to help others. I am now going to give back to my community. Mm -hmm. So how do we get that? It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of training. Again, when you use certain words that you use in support groups to the general public, it puts you right in that box. So right away you're labeled. So we've had a number of trainings at our center uh, from Faces and Voices of Recovery, the power of our stories. Mm -hmm. It's really important 
to use appropriate recovery languaging. I worked in um, methadone treatment for many years, and you know I saw the, some of the horrible languaging that went on, and a lot of it perpetuated by the patients themselves because they didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. This is what they always knew. So it was part of my journey to really push and really work with people to use language that you can be proud of wherever you are. So it, it takes practice, it takes um, a lot of tolerance, and it takes a lot of training. And Carol, how do you work with your community to, to shift that? I know you, you well, addressed it a little bit earlier. Well, one of the things that we're doing, um, me being the coordinator of a program where we're training people to be recovery coaches, um, one of the lessons that we teach in that um, course is for them to identify what they see, three different types of vendors. We give them the heroin addict, we give them the alcoholic, and we give them the person with some type of mental disorder. And we asked them to write down a list of names. Mm -hmm. And then once they finish, we'll put it up on the walls for them to see it while they're going through the rest of the training. And it's been amazing how many people started crying because all they put up there were negative terms. And one of the things that we have to start teaching within the recovery community is how do we really reclaim our place back into the community? Mm -hmm. We want to be a part of that community and I think right that we need to start looking at ourselves as fathers, mm -hmm. sons, parents. And I think with the negatives that we live for so long mm -hmm. and the self-loathing that we take on, we don't know that those things exist for us anymore because everything around us have told us that we're the worst. Absolutely. Go ahead, Cynthia. Well, one of the interesting research things show that if you talk positive about yourself and you say, I'm a good parent, I'm in recovery, life is good, I'm a good employee, that it actually changed the neurotransmitters in your brain and causes you to self-soothe and mm -hmm. self uh, feel that reward system increases. So we know that if we're, if we're teaching people to say things about their recovery in a positive way, it'll physically change their body. Yeah. And not only that, it will change, I, I in, in my view, it will change their actions into really more positive, exactly. more productive, exactly. and, and, a, and a, a much better outcome. Jeremiah, let's talk about the whole context of public policy and support for recovery support services. One of the main reasons that I think that we need to change this conversation mm -hmm. in terms of how, how we address people in recovery uh, in the broader society is because there is an awful lot of um, difficulty in, in, in finding support for recovery support services, correct? So, so how would, it, how would uh, uh, we proceed in order to get that broader society to be more supportive? Um, I think it starts at the community level, is that we have to, have, as a community, make sure that those things are okay to begin to talk about. And then we need to engage, you know, our legislatures and our lawmakers and the people that are at the table making those kinds of decisions to prioritize those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Senator Wellstone, 15 years ago, right. wrote a mental health bill and it took 10 years yes. to get that bill passed. That is sad that it takes so long yeah. for legislation to be passed that really addresses people with mental health issues, with substance abuse issues, as the same as somebody that has diabetes or that has cancer or any other disease. And I think as a society at large, we've accepted these other diseases as legitimate and that we're still on the fence about substance abuse. We're still on the fence about mental illness uh, because there's a negative stigma around it because with those diseases come consequences that you don't necessarily have with these other things. People get arrested for having a mental illness or for having a substance abuse problem and that's seen as shameful and I think that's where we need to start is, is changing the context of our conversation to be a positive, to be something that's supportive of those people. As you were saying earlier, one quarter of the people in this country in some way are affected by this. Let's own that and let's take that, yeah. you know? This is my point. I mean, can you imagine the 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 public education, or uh, I don't want to use other terms, so I have to watch my own term. Uh, the public education sector of the mental health community, mm -hmm. as well as the public education sector of the recovery uh, from addiction community, and all, all of these coming together to really voice a concern, mm -hmm. you know, for the fact that we need to be more supportive of recovery support services uh, would, would really change things, I right. think. Mm -hmm. Right. We have a huge advocacy in those two groups. Groups. Huge advocacy. In fact, if, if the 
people in recovery from mental health and the people in recovery from addictive disorders got together and decided on a pr who to elect for president, they could elect yes. them. Mm -hmm. They, they would could be a elect their Congress. That's right. right. They could elect their Congress. They could elect their city council, their county councils. Mm -hmm. If we began thinking about the self-empowerment, taking our power back, mm -hmm. not just for our own recovery, our family's recovery and our community's recovery, but the recovery of the United States yeah. from this addict, these disorders yeah. that, that permeate and yet that get so little attention. And that are costing society an awful yeah. lot, both right. in, in both the, the whole issue of trauma that you mentioned, right. as well as real costs you right. know, and, and lost opportunities. Well, and it wasn't yeah. 40 or 50 years ago where people that had substance use issues or that had a mental health issue were simply just locked up and put away somewhere right. else so that right. we didn't have to deal with them, you know? Right. So we have made progress, but I think as a society as a whole, I mean, it's still not where I think a lot of other countries are, where the rest of the world might be in, in sort of addressing these kinds of issues. We've come a long way in a short period of time, but that doesn't mean that it's okay. Go ahead. And I just wanted to add to what um, Jeremiah was saying. And I, I think when we hear those statistics that a quarter of a million, I think we need to either double that or triple it. Because we all just spoke about how addiction and mental disorder impacts the community. So when you look at the average person in recovery, they may have children that were impacted because of that addiction. Mm -hmm. So I think when we look at the messaging, when we're doing messaging about um, recovery, wellness, we need to also have a message that's also tailored to those families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you can't get their support if they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Because many of us, when we come into the recovery process, we're toxic and we don't understand right. mm -hmm. that there is a wellness opportunity. And I, I want to end on one note. I know, Jim, that you in Rhode Island for Recovery Month do an incredible job, as do many, many other of you. Uh, but in, in Rhode Island in particular, you had members of Congress. You had Tom Cordier, who was, um, uh, you faces know, voices, uh, yeah, you know, Faces and Voices and chief, yeah. chief of Staff, who was someone in recovery who was there. And um, I, I really want to point to that. It, it, it's really very powerful to see uh, those uh, elected officials yes. and appointed officials mm -hmm. be there in full the force. Embrace. And this is what communities can do uh, for Recovery Month. You can get together, you can voice your concerns, and you can voice the joy that you feel mm -hmm. for the total number of people that are in recovery in your community. Mm -hmm. And families can come together to support everyone who's in recovery. So I encourage you to go online and access our materials and join the Voices for Recovery in this September by hosting an event and getting involved. Thank you for being here. It's worth here. it. It's worth <laughs> it. Uh, it's been a great show. Thank, Thank you. you so much. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.